Good morning. On behalf of Darlene and the girls, I want to thank you for being here to show your support, your love, by your presence, by being here to support her at this most difficult time. I'd also like to tell you that while some refer to this as a funeral or a memorial, which is not inaccurate, we see it through a biblical lens as a celebration of life. Let me say it this way. Walter ain't dead. He's alive. And he's better than he's ever been. Where did I get that crazy idea? From God, who knows all things. And so while we see Walter's body here, his soul and his spirit were immediately taken to be in heaven with his Savior. This is the great hope that we have. And the hope that the Bible talks about is not a wishful hope that would say, you know, I, one day maybe I could fly. It's not that kind of hope. The hope that the Bible speaks of, the actual word, elpis, means hopeful expectation. It would be similar to us saying, I hope the sun comes up tomorrow. Well, we know it's going to. That's the hope that we have and we live with. And multiple times this week, we have talked about that. Where Rebecca and Jennifer and Darlene and I have talked about that and I've asked them each time, how are you doing? Physically, not so good. But their hope is in Jesus and that removes the sting of the separation. Because we understand that because of Jesus Christ, this is not goodbye. It's so long for now. And so we don't have that sting. Is Walter okay? Yeah, he's fine. It gives us permission to grieve because there's a loss. And so if you would, please pray with me. Father, as we spend this next hour, we ask that you would superintend over this time you see, Lord, we want for you to be glorified, to be seen, because you're the author of life, and you're the one that gives us breath. We also pray that we would honor Walter's life. What a privilege this is for me to honor a man who honored you in his life. What a great privilege I have. And Lord, I pray that you would bring comfort to Darlene, to each person here, I pray that you would give peace. And so, Lord, have your way. Be glorified. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. If you, there's a hymnal in front of you, and we're going to sing a song. This has particular significance uh, for here um, because, uh, Rebecca, what time were you awakened? So 1.17 a.m. Wednesday morning, Rebecca was wakened out of a sound sleep. This song was on her heart. She thought it might mean something. She had no idea. But in exactly 24 hours, her father would be taken home to heaven. And God gave her this song to prepare her heart. And she said that was meaningful to her. She needed that. That's the personal care God has for his children. So if you would open up to 7, is it 705? 705. And Kareem, would you? Okay, wonderful. Some glad morning when this life is over, I fly away.
Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away to a land where joy should never end. This next scripture is dear to us all. Darlene asked if we would read it. The context of this, it's John 14, 1 through 6, is that on Jesus' last night on earth before he went to the cross, he had just sent the disciples into deep depression by telling them that night one of them was going to betray him. One of them, another one, was going to deny him and Jesus was leaving. He saw their depression, looked them in the eye, comforted them with these words. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have gone, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I'm going. Thomas, don't you love Thomas? He always had the questions, the questions that we have. Then Thomas said to him, Lord, we, we do not know where you're going. How could we possibly know the way? Jesus looked Thomas in the eye and loved him and said, Thomas, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And so we have that promise that Jesus is coming back. Just a side note to this. The God who created the earth and the heavens in one week has been working on a place for those who have trusted alone in Christ alone for about 2,000 years now. What must that be like? Well, Walter already knows. Are you girls ready? We're going to hear some wonderful words. Rebecca and Jennifer.
My dad was also a fun man. He was always laughing or making a joke. He always saw the good in things. I was the kind of person who saw the glass half full, not half empty. He always had a way to make us smile, and we loved being around him. Everyone loved being around him. His grandchildren and great-grandson all looked forward to spending time with him and could not wait for when they could visit with him. They loved his way of making everything fun. Our dad was a wise man. If we needed advice, we knew our dad would share with us not only his knowledge, but also the wisdom that he had learned from God's word. Our dad was a godly man. He led his family to follow Christ. He was always in church, serving the Lord in whatever way was needed. He read his Bible faithfully. We remember countless times we would find him reading his Bible in the morning when he and mom would come to visit. We are so glad to know that our dad trusted Christ as his Savior and that we will see him again one day. For that is the only thing that makes his passing bearable. We miss him so much. We share all of this to hopefully give you a small glimpse of the wonderful man we called our father. We know we were very blessed to be called his daughters. We, we love you, Dad. You girls did wonderful. That was great. And those words, what parent wouldn't want their kids to say that and to know it's true? You girls did wonderful. We have a couple minutes. If anybody would like to add or say anything, maybe a short, very short story, or if you would like to say just a word about Walter, what, how he impacted your life. We have a moment right now. Would anybody like to say something? There's no pressure. Um, Walter's sister-in-law, his daughter-in-law, sisters, and, uh, <laughs> 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 and Walter and I always got along real well because Darlene and my husband always did the budgets and everything. Well, and I didn't know nothing to do with the budgets. They did that, and we would sit aside while they were doing all that, and we'd laugh and talk about it. But he was a wonderful, wonderful person, wonderful man, and I lost track of time. And when Darlene was dating him, uh, I kind of overlooked Darlene because I had, she was my little sister, and my mom worked, and I had to get back to her. So but anyway, when she was growing up and she was dating Walter, and uh, he was a wonderful man, gentleman, very, and I told her, but he didn't know the Lord. And I said, well, you can't marry my sister unless you come to the Lord, as find the Lord as your Savior. And he did. And, that's, and that was really the honest thing. He really did. He didn't just say it. He went and found a way and got the, save, got the Lord to save him. And he, but he's always been a wonderful, wonderful man and a gentleman, like the girl said, and loving and caring. And just he looked after my sister just wonderful. I, I do miss him because we had a lot of fun together. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Would anyone else like to say anything? Okay, then we're going to move on to the next part here, uh, which is a song. And we have uh, a uh, PowerPoint as well.
God will make all things new that day. Gone is the curse from which I stumbled and fell. Evil is banished to bow down to see the only sound is the praises to Christ our King slowly the names from the book are read I know the King so there's no need, no need to dread, no more night, no more pain, no more tears, never crying again. to the great I am. We will live in the light of the risen Lamb. See over there, there's a mansion, oh, that's prepared just for me. They are wonderful truths. Okay, we should be okay now.
Once again, please pray with me. Thank you, Father, for your words of encouragement at a time like this. And Father, we continue to pray that for Darlene and Rebecca, uh, for Jennifer, for their families, for the grandkids, even their great-grandson, for a peace that transcends all understanding that you promise for those who will turn to you. And now, Lord, through your servants speak that there would be comfort. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever noticed that some things in the Bible are a little hard to understand? It gets a little bit better with years of study, but there's still things that we look at and we say, you know, I'm not quite sure what that means. Let me give you an example. The Bible says that it's better to be in a funeral than a party. Did you know that? That sounds rather morbid, doesn't it? But Solomon goes on to explain why. Basically, what Solomon says is for us all to be sobered by this because this is the path that we're all going to go. And it's a kind of centering time. In the party, it's very easy for us to say, life is going to go on forever, and it's always going to be like this, and it's always going to be good. And yet we're denying the statistics. The statistics prove to us that every one out of one dies. And so none of us get out of here alive. And that's why Solomon said this is a great time to sit, to think, and to say, okay. And then it's times like this when those questions that we kind of push off with the busyness of life, they come crashing forward and they won't be denied. And so I wrote down just five questions that I want to use to guide me through this message. Does God know? Does he know about Walter? Does he know about our pain? Second question, does God care? Third question would be, how should we remember Walter? What things did we, could we learn from his life? Fourth question is, where is Walter right now? And the last question, can I know where I'm going. And so it's times like this that we can't always go to those people we always go to. Uh, if you have a financial problem, you can go to your CPA, to an accountant. If you have a health problem, you can go to your doctor. If you have a problem, a legal problem, you can go to a lawyer. But where do you go at a time like this? Who knows, right? These questions. Our Lord, and he's already answered them. And so I'm not here to give you any advice. What do I know that you don't know? And what does my word matter when it comes to eternity? But God, the author of eternity, has answers for these questions. The first one, does God know? Absolutely, yes, he knows about Walter, and he knows about your pain. Listen to what he's already said. Oh, Lord, you have searched me, and you know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise. This is a daily experience. You perceive even my thoughts from afar. You know my thoughts. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely. Does God know? He's sure he knows. But the next question is, does he care? I mean, there's... How many people on this earth now? Eight, were we up to eight billion? How could he possibly? He's omniscient. He knows all things. Does he care about this? Listen to what he says in Psalm 116. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. He takes this seriously. When it was just precisely the right time, he said, Walter, your reward is here. Come on home. And so it wasn't accidental. God had set the date from eternity past 
and it was his time. But how do we know he cares? Well, for that I turn to Psalm 23. Psalm 23 paints a picture for us of God as a shepherd. And so we tend to think that this picture should be hanging in the funeral home. But this is a picture for our home on the refrigerator. For this is not a picture for those who have gone on. It's for those who are here now. And it gives us confidence. Listen to what David said. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You see, God had David pick the picture of a shepherd. David was familiar with shepherds because he was a shepherd in his younger years. But this is a great picture because what David is pointing and what God wanted him to do was point to the shepherd. Because a shepherd's job, everyone in that society knew, was to provide for a sheep, to protect his sheep, and to guide his sheep. And now David goes on to talk about what happens when those sheep follow the shepherd. The first verse says so much for us. When David starts out, he says, the Lord. In our Bible, it says the Lord. In the Hebrew Bible, he picked a particular word to call God. It wasn't Elohim, which would mean God. It wasn't Adonai, which would be master, which would be commonly would refer to God. He picked Yahweh. Yahweh is God's personal name, which means there's a personal relationship with a loving God. And so David looks to a personal relationship that he has with God. And he says, the Lord, Yahweh, is my shepherd. Not our shepherd, my shepherd. Personal. He protects me. He guides me. He provides for me. The Lord is my shepherd. Why is this important to us? We look at this and we go, this was written 3,000 years ago. So what? Darlene, you already know this. Rebecca, you know this. Jennifer, you know this. The daddy that David speaks of is your daddy. And he will watch over you so that you can say the exact same thing. The Lord is my shepherd. One other interesting thing I see here. In Hebrew, it actually says, literally, Yahweh shepherding me. And so I get the picture that this is not saying, like, this person is our president. That's not what he's saying. It's much more personal. It's much more present. God is shepherding me. When I wake up in the morning, he's there. When I go through my day, he's there. When I go to bed at night, he's there. As a matter of fact, he put it like this. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And sometimes it's going to feel like it. And we've talked about this. When the girls go back, Man, is that house going to be quiet. But you're surrounded by people who care, and you all are going to call, right? And you're all going to send cards, not just one week out, two weeks out. This is one of the things that we're learning, Patty and I are learning right now, is we're going through something that's very serious. 
or Patty's health. There are some people that have done what she calls hanging back with us. Instead of just moving on with life, they keep coming back and saying, praying for you. A card comes. It's been six months. Some have forgotten us, but some have not. Be those that continue to send the cards, make the calls. The Lord's your daddy. He won't forget you. He'll never leave you. He will never forsake you because he's good. And so the first thing I think of at a time like this is, does God know? Yes. Does he care? He's already said that he does. He will provide. He's the shepherd for us. But the next question is, how can we honor Walter's life? You know, we can remember him. I want to borrow, actually, from Solomon. Solomon, David's son, wrote these words. You're familiar with them, but let me read a few of them just to remind you. Solomon wisely had taken life, and he had summarized life by seasons. Listen to what he said. There is an appointed time for everything, and there is a time for every event under heaven. There's a time to give birth and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal. There's a time to tear down and there's a time to build up. There's a time to weep and a time to laugh. I want to borrow from Solomon's format and I want to tell you about some of the times of Walter's life. A time to be born. God painted Walter into the family picture on March 25th, 1948. The proud parents were Walter Sr. and Shirley Lindsay. Walter grew up the second oldest of four children. A time to grow. Walter grew up in Camden, New Jersey, playing Little League Baseball and later playing baseball and football in, in high school. A time to serve. After graduating from high school, Walter served four years in the Air Force. I imagine that he settled in quite well there, but there was something missing when he got there. Which brings me to a time to love. Little did Walter and Darlene know how their budding friendship began in seventh grade. How it would blossom into a lifelong love affair. Walter made it real when on leave for Christmas from the Air Force that he visited his girlfriend, dropped to one knee, and asked her to go on a journey through life with him. You said yes, right? Okay. I think I thought I had that right. <laughs> on June 1st, 1968, they walked the aisle, committed before God and family to love one another in sickness and health good times and bad, to forsake all others, remaining faithful to one another till death do they part. They did it. They did it. What commitment you kept for 56 years. What joy you know because you didn't listen to society. You committed to one another in the good times, bad times, hard times, no matter what. And it's only with all those years do you know those things. A time to laugh. Darlene tells the story of how Walter and his friend Fran assembled an above-the-ground pool for their daughters. With the pool all assembled, all they needed to do was add water. But to do that first, Walter had to get out of the pool. Darlene suggested she get him a ladder to climb over the wall. Guys, don't you hate it when your wife gives you a suggestion and you say, I got this. And then it doesn't go well and you find out she's right. Walter said, I don't need a ladder. And he didn't. He quickly hiked over the wall. One problem, he leaned on the wall and the entire pool collapsed. <laughs> Back to the beginning. But what happened next is the most significant thing. He didn't teach the neighborhood new language. 
He didn't jump up and down. He didn't blame the pool. He didn't blame anybody else. He was clearly frustrated with himself, and yet he saw the humor in it, and he could laugh. They all had a good laugh. One more. Walter loved to pop-pop sit the grandkids. I call it pop-pop sitting because it's not just babysitting. A stage I'm moving into so I can learn some lessons here. So I've learned one already, what not to do. Another thing that Walter loved to do is something that probably a lot of you did, and I love too. He loved to watch the Three Stooges. And so he introduced his toddler granddaughter to the Three Stooges, and guess what? She loved it. They laughed and had yet another great shared event. He called them the Three Stooges. But to her, they were the funny guys. Alas, it was not to last. It was in Sunday school where she decided to entertain the other children by grabbing two of them by their heads and knocking them together. You can imagine the horror of the Sunday school teachers when they saw that happen. Where did you learn that? She was asked, and with angelic innocence, she said, that's what the funny guys do. Well, the evidence pointed right back at Walter. <laughs> and they tracked him down, and they all got a good laugh out of it, but there was a stern warning. No more Three Stooges. <laughs> the time for family. The world, words that you girls selected for your dad were the highest praise a man could get before the Lord Jesus. Thank you for that. How encouraging. Every dad wants to hear that from their kids. You described your father as a faithful man. We don't honor that enough. Today we look at how much money did they make, what position, what titles, how big was their house, and what projects did they undertake. And in the villages, how many holes in one did you have? But you know, at a time like this, it really doesn't mean all that much. They're great things, and we all know that we spend a lot of time with those things. But these are the things that are gold and golden as a legacy and as a memory and as a challenge to all of us. A faithful man, a fun man. I take it that your dad... He took God seriously, but he didn't take Walter too seriously. That's hard not to do. A wise man, that only comes through scripture, reading the scripture. Knowledge, we all have a lot of knowledge. We've lived a lot of years, we've learned a lot of things. But how do you apply that knowledge? That's wisdom. And a godly man. I don't take those terms lightly because the stories you shared with me and the picture you drew and the things I saw in Walter's life was he was a humble, quiet, godly man. Always there. Always count on him. He was a support. As Darlene shared a few memories, the same characteristic surfaced in my mind. In my mind, Walter understood godly leadership. You see, it's obvious. He loved you as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Together, you lovingly led your girls to Jesus. God commands us to, to share and to lead our children into a fear of the Lord. Walter understood servant leadership that Jesus called him to. He served at home, cooking breakfast for all the girls for your wedding. 
serving at work, serving at church, helping you teach Sunday school, taking second chair. We don't value the second chair enough in our society. He did. He understood the importance of that second chair. He served at the church in many areas. Deacon. Deacon means servant. And he was a servant at church. He was known as a peacemaker, an encourager. He was known to be wise. He was known to be humble. These are all the things that came out of the stories that you told me. And then even to the end. Darlene remembers the day a few weeks ago when they asked you to leave the hospital room so that they could put in, I think you said, a pick line. When she entered back into the room, she realized that they had put Walter on a ventilator. And the first thought was, I'm not going to hear his voice again. This has come to an end. We still there? Okay. But to be strong, you fought back the tears. And if I understand it right, the next morning, you walked in, and the ventilator was off, and you lost it. The emotions come crashing forward, and you started to cry. There's Walter in the bed, seeing his bride, his sweetheart, the love of his life, and his condition is making her cry. You know, weak and sick and not knowing it at the time, dying man reached out his hand. And he said, don't cry. Don't cry. See, she was always first. A time to believe. I want to read you some of Walter's words. I have folks write a few things down when they join our church. And so Walter, I know, crossed over from his words. So we can sit here at a time like this and we can say, yeah, we're all going to heaven, but Jesus didn't say that. Listen to Walter's words. He crossed over from death to life in May of 1968. Listen to what he wrote. I know I am going to heaven because I have accepted your son Jesus Christ as my savior. The question was, if God should ask you, how, why should I let you into my heaven? How would you answer it? That's his answer. What would your answer be? He goes on, I was a Catholic until age 20. I accepted the Lord Jesus as my Savior, and he parentheses, John 3, 16. In May of 1968, after speaking to Pastor Conan, is that the right pronunciation? Um, I was baptized at the First Baptist Church of Alamogordo, New Mexico. And so a time to believe. Walter mentions John 3:16. You know what it says, I know what it says, but I want to read it again. You see, it very clearly says, I'd so love the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. There's three things I would like to pick out of this to leave you with today and to give you encouragement that Walter is, as we know from Jesus' word, he is in heaven. The first thing I want you to see is God's love. The second is, um, it would be God's, uh, God's gift to us. And the third thing is God's offer. So the first thing is God's love. For God so loved you. For God so loved me. The word used there, world, is pointing to you and me, individuals. So for God so loved you. Isn't that amazing? I mean, when you really think about it, think about your life in plain terms. When I think about my life in plain terms, I don't think God would want to 
welcome me into heaven, I don't think he would open me, give me open arms. I think he would give me a backhand. We've all got a long list of things to be for honest with ourselves. And sometimes that causes us to run from God because we feel guilty. Because one thing we know about God is he's holy. He's never made a mistake, never had a bad thought, never done anything wrong. And yet, ooh, look at my list. Ooh, that's ugly. And yet he says, I so love you. Well, how much? God so loved you that he gave his one and only son. He gave us a gift. 2,000 years ago, Jesus came and he laid his life down on a cross. The number one reason why he came. Number one reason was to give his life as a sacrifice. You see, he paid for everything you've done wrong and everything I've done wrong. Everything everyone's done wrong for all time. The bill is paid in full. It's interesting. Jesus' words on the cross, his final words were to telestai. Now, that doesn't mean anything to us. What does to telestai mean? Well, it's also written grammatically in the perfect sense, which means something has been done and never needs to be done again, and the effects of this one thing will go throughout eternity. Everybody standing there knew what he said. You see, if you had a house back then and you paid off the mortgage, paid for your house in full, they, the tax collector would stamp your mortgage with the word to tetelestai, paid in full. But Jesus declared on the cross that he paid it in full. That's the gift that he gave you, he gave me, he gave Walter. And so, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. But here's the offer. If I say this again, I'm going to give you a test now, because in these words is a secret list of things that you and I need to do to go to heaven. Okay? Listen carefully. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Did you hear the list? It's a list of one. Whoever believes. Whoever trusts. I love the word whoever. I didn't grow up in church. And so it's not just, all right, whoever goes to church, whoever gives a lot of money to the church, whoever's a good person, whoever, whoever, whoever. It's whoever. Whoever will come to him and say, Jesus, I understand you paid it all. Walter did that in 1968. And I don't think he ever lost the joy of what he was given. I know I haven't. I've been given a gift that I did not deserve. And so the question here is, Jesus is looking to you and saying, I paid it all. Will you accept my payment? This would be a good time for you to do serious business with God. If you've never trusted alone in Christ alone, this would be a good day to do it. You can do it any day. You can do it any place. Don't put it off because you just don't know what a day will bring. And if Walter could be here today and talk to you, he would say, you know what I believe by faith? I now see by sight. I'm telling you, this crazy preacher is telling you the truth. He's telling you what God said. And so trust in Christ today. Go to God and say, God, I understand. I've made a lot of mistakes. I, am, I ain't perfect, but I'm trusting in Jesus. Would you save me? Would you save me? And he will. God know? Sure he knows. But does he care? Yes, he does. He cares about you personally. You. He cares about you. He cares about all of us personally. Does Walter's memory live on in our hearts 
it does. In our memories, it does. But more importantly, he lives on. You see, the Bible teaches us very clearly that to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. And so I take from that that when Walter closed his eyes early that morning, he opened them up in heaven. When he took Earth's, the last breath of Earth's stale air at 1.16 Thursday morning, his very next breath was heaven's fresh air. He's good. He's great. He's better than he's ever been. And so we praise God because the same can be true for us, which brings me to the last question, the only question left here. Will you be there? Walter wants you there. We want you there. We've talked about this. I know you'll be there. Rebecca will be there. Maureen will be there. I know Corrine will be there. We've trusted in Jesus, not because we're such good people, but because we're such needy people. And I'll lead the list of needy people. Would you please pray with me? Oh Lord, how can we thank you for Walter's life enough? A man who was a godly father a man who was a fun man, a faithful man, a man who loved his family sacrificially, a man who understood that he came in last because his job was to be the servant leader and the first will be last. So now he's first. Thank you, Lord, for his life, for his example, for his legacy that he leaves to his daughters, to his granddaughters, to his great grandson, and to those who knew him, friends and neighbors and family. Thank you for his life. And now, Lord, we pray for that peace that transcends all understanding for Darlene throughout these next days, weeks, and years. That she would feel your presence because the orphan and the widow need you and you love to take care of them. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Stepping on shore and finding a heaven of touching a hand and finding it God of breathing new air, finding it celestial.
Alex, Kareem, thank you. Teresa, thank you. Kathy, thank you. This concludes this celebration. I'm going to ask the family to stay up here in the front pew. So if you would like to see and talk with them, uh, they'll be right here. Uh, the pallbearers are going to come forward, and they're going to escort Walter out through the front of the church. So if you would give them a minute, if you just kind of exit through the side aisles or come up through the side aisles, they can exit through the center aisle. So keep that clear if you would. Let me pray. Thank you, Father, for this celebration. Now, I pray that you would watch over each, each person here, give them safety and guidance, to demonstrate to them that you are their shepherd too. And I pray, Father, that everyone who can hear my voice will trust alone in Christ alone as the only way to peace with God, the best life here and now, and eternal life in heaven. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.